First, I'll introduce you, Aaron Copeland, our CTO, fearless tech leader at Voltage, um, leading huge clients like Chipotle through very complicated and technical challenges that that they face and other clients as well, and our, and and also managing and leading our tech team. And uh, Aaron, you've got a pretty awesome history and background too in technology. Maybe you could just share a little bit about you know where you came from and and what you do at Voltage. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Where I came from, uh, you know, my love for technology started off from a very young age. Um, I grew up with, you know, original IBM computers at my home. Uh, my father always kind of fostered that, you know, growing up, you know, on into high school. Um, I was a jock by day. And then at night, I would close myself in my room and learn computers. And, you know, as with anybody, you know, in the the early days of the internet, you know, you start consuming a lot of knowledge. And I started uh, learning from a lot of good folks online about, you know, programming and like how to, you know, make systems work in general. Um, That's pretty and, funny story though, Aaron, the closet nerd yet the, what sports were you playing? Oh, I played baseball. I played basketball. Uh, oh. I played football for a while, but I decided ultimately that I didn't like brain injuries and uh, I didn't want to get hit anymore. That's the reality of it. I was, uh, <laughs> yeah. it may look tough on the outside, but I certainly wasn't on the inside. So wow. it, uh, yeah, but I, uh, I always had a love for technology and, you know, I, I knew from a pretty early age that, you know, technology is where I wanted to be. Um and all along the way through college, um, early on in my career, um, you know, I focused between, you know, web applications, application development, um, but specifically in advertising and working for advertising agencies. And I found that, you know, that path led me to a whole like plethora of technologies, um, you know, that I've learned over the years. And, and with that came you know, the responsibility and due diligence of, you know, protecting our clients and, you know, our businesses that I work for, um, you know, from cybersecurity threats. Um, and so that that passion has never faded. Um, and it's serving us well now, I think, right, as like, as we continue to see larger and larger data breaches happen, um, you know, I'm really getting to play into that side of my brain that I fostered long ago, Um that I absolutely love and I, and I respect very deeply. What's changed since, since the early days, Aaron, when you're, when you're breaching kind of some of these topics of cybersecurity and clients are, are worried about it and what's happening now, especially as you know, in the current day, we've got really big companies, you know, getting, um, I don't know what you call it, hacked or just compromised or a, a little bit of both. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, Early on in my career, um, the hot thing to do was, you know, take down a, a business's website, right? Um, deface their website, put something funny, a funny meme or a picture on there. Um, you know, there were still serious hacks going on at the time, even in the early days of the internet, you know, there were still serious, you know, data breaches happening. Um, but really what changed over time was the introduction of big data, right? Like mm -hmm. the amount of data that companies and businesses are now acquiring um, through legitimate and sometimes illegitimate means. Um, and they're storing, you know, for future use or for use in existing algorithms and their applications, right? You know, they store the data and some companies protect the data and other companies don't protect the data. And what we're finding is, you know, and what we're seeing, honestly, is uh, the lack of investment in cybersecurity <laughs> of protecting big data, right? And protecting the data that's on these servers. Um, so that wasn't, you know, early days, again, there was always data there um, since, you know, databases were invented, ways to store, you know, quantities of data. Um, yeah. But the amount of personal information that's out there and the amount of detail at which it is recorded has changed um, as well. Um, you think of like, you know, all the analytics suites that are out there and the profiles that we could make on potential customers uh, or users of your application, that's changed. And it takes a substantial amount of data to, you know, to create that profile. Um, and that's the kind of data that we're talking about. In addition to some very serious data, um, 
you know, PII type stuff, credit card information. Um, heaven forbid you would start thinking about HIPAA, you know, and violating medical, you know, records, mm -hmm. things like that. Um, these are some serious implications for the kind of data that's being, you know, breached these days and stored. That's interesting. So like back in the day and we voltage, I remember like when we had our very first like WordPress site, it someone did take it down and put up a skull and it was made out of the words poop, poop, poop. <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. ASCII art was a big thing, man. That, you know, the, that's, that's hilarious because script, script kitties is what we used to call them. Um, yeah. And these are the people that have no business. They don't understand hacking, right? They're, they're on some website forum and they see this funny little script that they can just run against your website. Right. And yeah. it just does all the work for you. But that's, that's, that's hilarious. I, I, I know remember we were stuff like that. Tiny little shop too. And it was just, it was just funny, but I can't remember how we cleaned it up. Um, and, but you know, it's funny to hear, like you said, I remember that. And like now again, you've got, of course, you know, people want to commit fraud with personal money uh, information and credit card information, but what else are they doing? Are there other things they're doing with this data? Are like, they reselling it or, I mean, what are companies Absolutely. worried about, I guess? Yeah. So again, <laughs> we're talking about large scale quantities of data that's being breached. Um, and depending on the data, right. Kind of dictates where it goes to be sold. Sometimes, you know, it's washed and it's sent out into the ether and put on, you know, public websites that you and I can go to, to bid on it, to try to get it. Do we know where the information came from? No, but there's a strong likelihood that that information came from a cybersecurity breach. Um, the less talked about methods, right? Or, you know, you're finding that information, those data sets on the dark web, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, each record, depending on the level of uh, complexity or the data that's included in those records, kind of dictates the price tag. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and some records, you know, can go for $100 an entry. And when you're talking about, you know, a million rows in a table or something like that, you can do the math, it gets very expensive yeah. really quick, which starts to point towards these are not just mom and pop, you know, uh, you know, brothers in a garage somewhere, you know, mm -hmm. doing this, right? These are organized crime syndicates in some <laughs> instances yeah. that are very well organized, very well funded, um, that are going after the data. And, you know, of course, it's going to be sold. Um you know, most cases that, you know, we see is like, you know, these people, the the hackers, you know, they, they want to make money, right? That they, they, They're in it for the money. Um, Do you ever again, see they, like any corporate terrorism type stuff? Like we want to, you know, take control of certain things or hold people hostage in scenarios. Oh, um, man, absolutely. You don't have to look too far back in the news to you know, start to see some of the the energy companies, right? Um, uh, I forget the name of, of one of the more prolific ones over the past year, but um, they got hit with ransomware, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're seeing ransomware happening a lot. And these what, are folks, go ahead. Yeah, what is ransomware exactly? Like just top level. So... Just like uh, you see in the movies with like, you know, kidnapping somebody and you <laughs> yeah. know, taking them and demanding a, a ransom payment. Uh, instead of a human being, they're taking your computer, essentially. Um, they find a way um, through some back channel means to install something on your machine, um, you know, that basically encrypts your hard drive. Right. And. Mm -hmm. The only thing when you power up your PC or your laptop, uh, you'll see a message that says, hey, you know, you've been hacked by whatever. Your computer is currently locked. If you don't send us, you know, a Bitcoin, you know, in the next X yeah. amount of hours, you know, we're going to wipe your computer. Right. Crazy. <laughs> so you start getting really a like, ransom like hostage scenario. Yeah. And it gets it gets pretty, pretty gnarly pretty quick because you you think about how these happen, right? Like sometimes it's as simple as one of, you know, your employees at your business clicking on a seemingly harmless link in an email, right? Going to a site, 
doing something on there that they think is normal or it's been requested of them from a legitimate business. Um, it's not legitimate. Uh, they go there, they fill up the information, they click on the button. Guess what? They just installed, you know, a piece of malware on their machine. But that mm-hmm. malware doesn't always just stop right on your machine. It likes to spread itself out and branch. Um, because again, it's quantity, right? If you can get, mm-hmm. you know, 10 computers instead of one or a network server, um, you know, you're talking a lot of money that comes in at a short amount of time without a l- large amount of investment from the hacker. So. Wow, that's crazy. So, you know, it's been interesting to see this come up more and more. And, and um, Aaron, you're so experienced in this and been able to lead many of our clients through different scenarios where they, you know, need to protect and plan and prepare for this kind of thing. And and as things change, you've got to be constantly vigilant. What What would you say as a client? Like, what do they need to be aware of? Or how do they even know if they're if they're at risk, I mean, where does it all start? I would say, you know, the number one thing is, you know, if you're a business and if you don't know if you're at risk or not, you're at risk. Got it. <laughs> that, that, that's <laughs> yeah. the number one thing that I can say. Ignorance um, is not good in this scenario. <laughs> ignorance is not bliss. That is for sure. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and it, it, it's something that you used to be able to, as a small business, at least, um, you could, you know, kind of scoot by uh, your day-to-day business and not, you know, have to worry as much about, you know, cybersecurity threats. Um, But now with all the automation that's happening with the hacking tools and stuff like that, you know, it's not, (laughs) it's not biased, right? It it will target at just about anybody. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, taking a, the first question you should ask yourself is like, where do I begin? Right? Like Mm -hmm. that is, how do I start? Um, And that's often times the most difficult step to take, Um, you know, small businesses and uh, are often strapped for resources. You know, they want to client to client, you know, or project to project. Um, Cybersecurity is something that oftentimes, you know, businesses don't want to invest in until it's too late. Um, but it doesn't have to be a, we're going to stop the show of our day-to-day business to, you know, to make a cybersecurity program within our business, right? Like, or to introduce a cybersecurity, um, it's a slow evolving process, but understanding where your weaknesses are is the first step of, you know, fixing the issue or introducing, you know, a program like this. Um, most of the times that is, you know, performing a risk assessment on your business, Um, you know, whether it's one that, you know, you find online and you decide to, uh, you know, execute it yourself as a business, or you, you know, hire a fully qualified, you know, cybersecurity partner, you know, or, or even Voltage, you know, we, I, myself, and I know several on our teams from a web application experience, uh, you know, can do that, right? We understand where those vulnerabilities lie um, and and how to address those types of issues. But yeah, definitely doing a risk assessment is the first step to understanding like, what is my risk profile? I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. And from what I understand, Aaron, I mean, a lot of it is just, like you said, going through answering certain questions. Um, You know, are you going deeper to, are you actually looking at architectures and systems and and the actual technology beyond that, you know, just like the yeah. surface level of, you know, what software you're using, what servers are using, where are they hosted? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> there's a lot to it, right? There's, there's no simple yeah, I mean... way to answer the question, but <laughs> the assessment and risk analysis portion of it um, is, is basically creating a roadmap, understanding you know, what are your digital assets as a, 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 um, of your business, right? Uh, what data does your business store? What is, data does it store for, you know, your users or your clients' users? Understanding where, you know, that identifies a lot of risk right off the bat. Um, your devices, you know, that are connected, uh, your network, Right. Uh, those are all the kind of things that you have to look at pretty quickly. Um, and it doesn't have to be a super in-depth dive. Um, but there are great 
resources out there. There are tools um, in addition to, you know, qualified companies that help you achieve that kind of uh, understanding. But yeah, that's uh, the first thing you got to do is understand what, what are the components that make up your business from a digital perspective? Um, and most importantly, what data are you, you know, what are you protecting storing and, and what are, what do you need to protect? Yeah. yeah, definitely. No, that's great. And I love how you're talking about, you know, making a roadmap. It sounds like, um, is that kind of part of that initial analysis? Would you say kind of making a plan or does that, is that another phase or, or a lot of work to do? Yeah. So I would say to, to be kosher, we'll call it a cybersecurity policy. Uh, <laughs> that's the, that's the, that's the, the term, right. Um, yeah. You know, and it's a policy, you know, because it's something you need to abide by, right? Like you, you, how is your business going to approach security in general? Um, and this documentation serves, you know, not only as a reminder to your employees to, you know, present and future, um, but as a starting point for iterating over the years, right? Um because you and I both know, Eric, that like cybersecurity isn't something that you're just like, whoop, I'm going to install this and we're done. It's something that you have to stay on top of indefinitely, right? Yep. Um, now, the the level of um, time and effort that you as a business will put into it, you know, will gradually, you know, kind of plateau. It will lower, then it will plateau to a more manageable amount. Um, mm -hmm. But that puts you in a really good position to be able to... Um, to introduce new new tools and uh, new policies. So yeah, the cybersecurity yeah, sure. policy is definitely something that your your initial goal is what you, that that's what you're working for towards your initial goal. Um, yeah, and that's great. What else? Yeah. Were you gonna say? I was just going to say. I mean, the 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 purpose of that is really defining you know the responsibilities in the cybersecurity policy. You're really kind of talking about the responsibilities. Uh, for employees regarding security practices um, and how you respond to incidents, right? Um, your incident responses are, those are becoming increasingly more important, especially, you know, with recent SEC rulings, right? That are, <laughs> it, yeah. it's, their companies are starting to be held accountable, right? You need to tell us when an incident happens and how you communicate it can make all the difference in the world. So having almost like a communication plan on top of everything, like how do you yep. tell your customers or tell your company? I mean, you have employees too that probably have data that's sensitive, you know. If, um... Yeah, and that's all all a part of the cybersecurity, you know, policy and, and your practice within your organization is uh, not just, you know, the the servers that you may host inside of your business, right? It, it's mm -hmm. every application that your business uses, G Suite, Office 365, um, you know, it can be Zoom, for instance. Uh, mm -hmm. But then it goes all the way from, you know, not just your work laptops or your work PCs, but to personal PCs and personal cell phones and how do they access, you know, work email and is that protected? Um so your it's ultimate the whole goal ecosystem of all ab yeah. absolutely and the reality is that you know there are a significant amount of fortune 500 companies that you know they're not at that that upper echelon of cybersecurity like we would think they would be mm -hmm. um it's very hard you know for a business to become completely impenetrable right but you hope that by following you know, some standards uh, and controls uh, that you do enough to mitigate, you know, a very large percentage of would be, you know, hackers or um, actors of with mal malicious intent. Yeah, because I can imagine, I mean, you have to be able to detect it. I, I can imagine Absolutely. things try and go undetected. So it's like detection. What are your, what are your, what's your policy for making sure you find something and find it? As you know, as soon as something goes awry or slightly, you know, how do you keep it from sliding in? There's, you know, under the radar. Yeah, and that's, and that's an, it, right. It's an interesting topic, right? Because 
who, I mean, I'm not available 24 seven sitting at my PC, looking at every single interaction that happens, you know, on our servers that we manage or internal servers. Um, but, you know, we work with, you know, Tekus, our cybersecurity partner, um, and they do a great job of doing that 24 seven, you know, threat yeah. response um, and incident response. They take care of things. I mean, not that we have a lot of incidents, you know, or any incidents at all, but like if something looks suspicious, you know, we're notified of that. And that's where, you know, partners like that really come into play, especially for small businesses, you know, mid-sized businesses even. Mm -hmm. um, that don't want to invest in internal staff that's dedicated to doing this. Um, you know, so there are options for businesses of all sizes to, you know, immediately make a difference in their cybersecurity plan and policy by implementing, you know, by simply having a partner that helps them with that kind of, you know, that kind of management, so to speak. Yeah. And that's kind of how we've worked with our clients, right? We've, we've aligned with, a partner, um, like a cybersecurity partner, um, and then been kind of in instrumental in, in walking people through these steps you're talking about, mm -hmm. implementing the changes. Actually, you know, we have a, a great team of developers that you lead and uh, technologists to help do that. I mean, what is that the best way to approach things or does it depend on the size of the company? Aaron, I mean, it sounds Absolutely. like everyone might have different needs, right? Everyone has different needs. Honestly, it does. Um, I would say that, you know, voltage is a, <laughs> I might be biased, right? Voltage is a step above the rest when it comes to some of this, right? Um, you know, we have a very high level of talent from an engineering perspective that goes across you know, a lot of different platforms, a lot of different cloud hosting providers, um, and a lot of knowledge on, you know, government regulations, compliance and policies um, and, you know, incident responses. Like there's a lot of knowledge that we have um, that you wouldn't expect a, you know, a, an ad agency or a development shop to necessarily have, um, which, you know, brings up my next point is, you know, having somebody with that kind of experience is critical, Right in my opinion, because, you know, oftentimes uh, as a business, uh, you might be looking to, you know, try to find a cheaper alternative to, you know, build a website or an e-commerce platform, whatever it might be. Um, but if you're security minded, um, you'll want to make sure that you vet that from your development shop, whoever you're working with, because, you know, in my experience um, with, you know, not all offshore teams or, you know, all <laughs> those kinds of partners, right? Um, they're not always equipped with U.S. legislation, right? And privacy rules that are specific here in the United States. Um, you might get some coverage, uh, but in the end, right, like you're going to, that's typically one of the first things that gets left out, right, is cybersecurity scans or penetration testing, things like this that really make sure that your your website or your web application is ready to go up and ready to be facing the public and not going to cost your business, you know, thousands of dollars or even more, you know, based on an incident that happens. So yeah, no like, vetting. Yeah. You're right. No, and I, I always tell people, Aaron, you know this. I mean, we have, like you said, such experience, um, such a great team of developers and and we're we're in-house in the sense we're remote but we're all here close to each other we're fairly close within the u.s and we are constantly fixing things from offshore teams and constantly uh -huh. do it right and a lot of it's the, the the culture that we've set for 15 years of, of being in uh, uh the the firm that we are and it's all the leadership we've had over the years where we've I mean, we've worked with Adidas, we've worked with Yal Raven, worked with Reebok, huge companies on their e-commerce platforms that they can't be down for one minute. You know, there's, you lose a lot of money. And so we've, we've, we've got very, um, I would say detailed and uh, diligent, like Q and A's and testing before anything's ever launched live. And that same kind of culture is into our web apps team, you know, working on custom technology and software and, now meeting all the security issues. I love how you, 
you said that in a very politically great way, <laughs> but it is true. I mean, you want to yeah. fix, I tell people like you pay the price to do it right now or, or pay three times that to do it right later. Absolutely. And we're not just talking about, you know, the fact that we build amazing websites and, you know, applications that, you know, very low bug counts and, you know, issues along the way. Uh, but that cybersecurity part is huge because if you miss that and you're not aware and taking care of those things up front, you know, any chance or any money that you saved on, you know, going with a cheaper alternative um, and dealing with bugs and whatever it might be is now going to be spent on, you know, cybersecurity audits and assessments of your business um, or fixing, you know, data related issues. PR, I mean, the list goes on and on, right? There's a yeah. lot that goes into an incident response. So it's uh, a, yeah. it's a huge cost and it can cost a business dearly. And in some cases, the entire business, if you're not careful. So, yeah. And when you're working with a publicly traded company, you know, I mean, it does affect everything. It can affect stock. I mean, we've seen it, you know, through big companies that just take huge hits from what would seem like small incidences, but they really do play a big part in, in the health yeah. and, and, and image and appearance of, of the company. Aaron, really quick, you mentioned like the rules that the U S is the U S constantly changing the rules. Are they getting more strict? What, I mean, just overview, like what would you say is happening and what do people need to be aware of as far as sure. like you said, responding and just taking the cybersecurity threats seriously? Yeah, I, I would say that we're evolving. Right. And I, I think that, you know, the people and the citizens of the U.S. and that in, also including our government uh, have gotten very tired of the citizens data being breached on a weekly basis. Um, you know, we we look a little further back to, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook and that whole business that went down uh that was a massive data breach. And that was the first kind of spotlight that really shined uh, this whole ecosystem of data breaches. And people are like, wait a minute, you know, I give a lot of information. So as we evolve, right, um, we see GDPR over in Europe, right? And that's coming, you know, we're abiding and we're taking care of that on our web applications. We have... Uh, all the stuff coming out of California. Um, and California seems to be kind of the test bed for a lot of that, you know, legislation mm -hmm. that like, well, does it work? Okay, yeah, it kind of does. So it's going to start to move up. Um, you know, you have the SEC taking a, a bigger look at the picture. I mean, they've always been involved, but like, you know, now starting to say like, you have to respond to this incident with the next amount of time, you know, and laying out framework or a guideline for businesses and how they should treat these kind of re threat responses. It's huge. Um, and people are tired of it, right? They're, they're, they're tired of their data being stolen. And, you know, we look back to this past week, Sony was hacked yet again. Right. And <laughs> whoops, you know, and, and what what really happens Oops. you know yeah. what happens to sony because this is like i don't know the 10th time in the past few years that it's happened and these aren't small breaches um 23 and me was mm -hmm. recently hacked and a data breach happened there and now we're talking oh well you don't have just personal information guess what you have genetic data you, you know you have all this kind of information <laughs> that we're being close. It's very personal. Yeah. <laughs> but then you start to think about like, oh no, well now you can identify a group of protected classes, right? Mm -hmm. The 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 yeah. picture becomes much bigger. Um, yeah. And so getting back to original statement that you made of like, um, you know, cyber warfare, like, you know, people taking out like uh, energy grids, things like that, you know, those are those are the larger um, those are the larger issues that come from a lack of cybersecurity response. It's not just oh man, somebody stole you know all my check-in location from Facebook. It's <laughs> you know some serious information that not only puts you know your 
business at risk. It puts, you know, it can put your nation at risk. It can put a protected class or, you know, whatever it might be very much at risk. Um, so a lot of considerations that aren't just about your business, right? It's about everyone. So even a smaller e-commerce clients addressing this because maybe they're uh, in one case potentially getting acquired. And so the company needs to know how secure they are and what what policies they have in place. I like, you know, how you say that. I don't, I don't know the terminology, but as well, but you know, those are the, those are the kind of things that you need to educate yourself on, you know, like some of the lingo, um, some of the stuff that's happening and we're all getting educated from the, the news unfortunately, like you said about Sony and different things mm-hmm. like that. But, but, you know, the, the more you can get, um, understand what's going on and, and then take a look at your business. And, and I think having a consultancy like us, someone like you, Aaron, to walk people through it is a great step. Like you said, there's ways for people to go online and take tests. There's other pure, um, security partners, but being able to have a, a partner that can bring all the pieces together that you need, that the company might need, depending on what size or what the threat or what amount of data or the protection level they need, we can recommend all that. And so. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, we're going to be writing some, you know, some, some good content, you know, for our website as well. Um, that's yep. going to have some of the, the that information there. Um, but I would, you know, I would love to help anyone and everyone, yeah. you know, become yeah. more efficient and, uh, you know, to, to learn how to navigate this. Um, yeah. it's, it's something I care very deeply about. So, well, and I know that too. And the culture of voltage is anyone who's worked with us knows it's to be a force for good. You know, that's why I started the company and Aaron, you live that. I mean, we, we do want to help people and you talk so well about it. And just like the way you're talking about it, like helps me understand it. You know, again, it's like not everyone has time to sit down and figure it out. I doubt, you know, a super busy CEO, really has time to dig into the weeds either. And so they need someone to just help them figure out what they need to do step by step. Well, you think about it, right? Like you're in a larger business, right? And to nail on what you just said, you know, if I'm a cybersecurity guy and I'm going and I'm presenting to the board, right? About, you know, why we need, you know, a hundred thousand dollar investment, you know, in cybersecurity, you know, I'm going to show, you know, data, I might show data, you know, data points and like, oh man, you know, this is going to cost us this much. It really is about breaking it down to the lowest common denominator when you're talking about it, because knowing your audience is the only way to effectively communicate this kind of information because it's complicated. And a lot of these materials, as you start the cybersecurity journey are like very difficult to understand. Uh, They're borderline like reading, you know, privacy policies and, you know, terms of use statements that are 15 pages long. And, you know, so kind of to your point, understanding the terminology, right. And being able to provide real world examples, you know, that um, help tell the story to um, these kinds of folks is, is critical in communicating the the importance um, of establishing, you know, cybersecurity practice. And it, it's, it, it, there's a lot, you know, you look yeah. at every single step that it takes to establish a security, you know, related practice at your business. And it's, it's not just like three items, right? Like there's like 15 bullet points, right? And under each one of those bullet points, there's a whole lot of work that needs to be done in each one of those. So, but realizing that, you know, you cover a little bit in each one of those, you're probably going to be okay, you know, as long as you continue to make progress. So, yeah. And I think that's, I mean, that's what we talk about when it comes to marketing too, making it a part of your culture, making it a part of your business, because, you know, you constantly need to be moving forward. And I think this is the same thing. You need to build that into your culture, into your budgets. And I mean, some people may not even know, Aaron, that you can actually give yourself a score, you know, through a lot of these things. And you can know from one to 10 where you're at. And then you can really monitor when you get up to a two or a five or a six that you are making progress. And, um, and you're, you know, so it gives you just by that nature, you know, steps and a plan and a roadmap to, to work toward. And, and, you know, you, you, you just take it off and take it as you can. Absolutely. Yeah. This isn't something that is built overnight. It's a, 
matter of fact, most of the security assessments that are out there, right, um, they try to establish an understanding of the maturity of your cybersecurity practice through their assessments. Um, and that typically means that, you know, depending on how you answer these assessments, right, by what you select, yes, we have this, or no, we don't have this, essentially, um, they can tell that, like, yeah, you're at the beginning of your cybersecurity journey, or, yeah, you have some very mature type of security practices in place. Um, and, and the reality is that a lot of it comes down to what documentation do you have? What playbooks do you have as a business, um, you know, to respond to incidents or you know your disaster recovery plans things like that those are all uh documents that you know as you mature you need to have in place um because they you may think they may not ever be used but when you need them the most you know you you really hope that they're there that you can reference them and then handle the situation with grace and ease yeah well, awesome, Aaron. I'll you get back to, to cranking. Awesome, Eric. It was awesome, man. Appreciate Thank it. You. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Yeah.